What if James had kept the invisibility cloak part five? Hey, brother! My goodness, my gracious, when we first asked this question, never in a million years did we think it would take a whole five parts to answer, but I promise today that we have finally reached the grand finale. As per always, you'll get the most details if you watch from the very beginning, but if you're picking up right here or just need to be caught up, here's the quick refresher. Dumbledore tells Harry this bit of information in King's Cross Station. But the cloak I took out of vain curiosity, and so it could have never worked for me as it works for you, its true owner. We here at Super Carlin Brothers submit that this special ability is to make the cloak's true owner, which would be Harry, not just invisible, but completely unfindable. And because of this, Voldemort is unable to attack Harry at Godric's Hollow, so he creates a false calm in the wizarding world for a full decade until Harry arrives at Hogwarts, where Voldemort himself implements the usage of the Diary Horcrux to infiltrate Hogwarts and attempt to kill Harry. Harry, as always, rises to the occasion and defeats the Diary, and Dumbledore is able to learn of Voldemort's usage of the Horcruxes. For the two years following, Voldemort is unable to mount any additional attacks, believing Harry is too protected, but strikes again at the Quidditch World Cup, where Barty Crouch Jr. once again steals Harry's wand in the top box. And in the chaos that follows, Harry is now completely unarmed and defenseless as Voldemort attempts Avada Kedavra, but Lily's protection from so many years prior is activated, destroying Voldemort's body and lodging a piece of himself inside of Harry and leaving Harry with like some super cool lightning bolt scars across his chest. Harry's fame at the public downfall of Voldemort catches the attention of Fleur when she arrives at Hogwarts for the Triwizard Cup later that year. But there is no plot to make Harry compete, though he does become the thing that Fleur would miss the most and is therefore hidden beneath the lake for the second task. Death Eaters are made aware by Karkaroff, who is just also still a Death Eater in this case, and Harry is taken before the start of the task and hauled into the Forbidden Forest. In the forest, Voldemort returns via the Philosopher's Stone he was able to steal from Gringotts mixed with Harry's blood, but is fended off by Priori Incantatum and the Twin Cores. But because Fleur discovers that Harry is missing at the bottom of the lake, Dumbledore and Ministry officials, including a Minister of Magic, Barty Crouch Sr., arrive on the scene to witness Voldemort's return. In Harry's next year, Dumbledore starts instructing Harry about the Horcruxes, explains his injured hand from the Ring Horcrux, and teaches him more defensive magic in the Room of Requirement. They make their usual attempt at the locket with the same results. It's unfortunately a fake. Meanwhile, all year, Barty Crouch Sr. is obsessed with hearing the contents of the prophecy and lures Harry to the Department of Mysteries, where Harry is ambushed by Death Eaters. Voldemort and Dumbledore duel like always, but heavily injured by the Cave Potion and the Ring curse, Harry is forced to step in and blast Voldemort with golden flames. Badly weakened from everything, Dumbledore returns to Hogwarts where he finally and sadly dies. Going into the next summer, Harry is finally introduced to Sirius where they discover the real locket is actually hidden at number 12 still per Regulus. Snape, who hasn't killed Dumbledore, delivers him the Sword of Gryffindor per Dumbledore's wishes, which Harry then promptly uses to destroy the locket. Hooray! Voldemort, meanwhile, travels to the Lestrange Vault to heal his burns using the Philosopher's Stone, and this provides such relief that it bridges a gap to Harry, who discovers the location of Huffpuff's Cup. Voldemort then begins his hunt for the Elder Wand, which he gets. The Golden Trio is also up to their usual antics and break into Gringotts, where they secure the cup, and in a stroke of brilliance, Harry uses the sword to destroy the Philosopher's Stone, turning the otherwise silver weapon completely gold. Unfortunately, though, the reigning treasure inside of the vault forces the sword from his hand. Voldemort is alerted of the break-in via the dark mark and immediately arrives on scene where he discovers the sword lying amongst all the gold. Bellatrix also appears in an effort to help, but in a wave of rage, Voldemort kills her and uses her death and the newly discovered sword to forge his latest defense. Where we see the glittering rubies of the sword of Gryffindor flicker once before suddenly erupting into a violent shade of of green and a new Horcrux is born. So coming into our final installment, Harry has destroyed the locket and found the cup. Voldemort, meanwhile, has the Elder Wand and has created the Sword Crux, and the diadem and the soul inside of Harry himself still stand in his way. Hey, brother! 
before we dive on in, we need to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Shopify. If you've ever bought a piece of Super Carlin Brothers merch, coffee, or candles, then you've interacted with our very own Shopify store. Now, in case you're unaware, Shopify is a global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. And what that means is if you have an idea for a product or already have a business of your own and want to take it online, then Shopify can turn the idea into a reality with ease. For us here at Super Carlin Brothers, when we create merch, we genuinely see it as a two way street. We want to provide cool, fun stuff that you're interested in and also be sure that you can take pride in the fact that you've supported us as independent creators. And what I love is that Shopify helps us do this by having a massive battery of available reports that can break down sales by days, weeks, months, or even years, all of which is letting us know which products you're liking and what's not working. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the United States and Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklyn and, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. And guys, you can sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash SCB. That's all lowercase. Again, go to shopify.com slash SCB. Now to grow your business, no matter what stage of the process you're in, one last time, shopify.com slash SCB. Link is in the description down below. Okay, we'll pick up right where we left off. Voldemort certain that the security of Gringotts can't possibly be breached again, and that additional security will be added to the Lestrange vault, Voldemort seals his new golden horcrux inside the vault and exits Gringotts intent on checking on the safety of all of his other horcruxes. Certainly the boy couldn't have discovered them all. Back on the dragon, Harry has been privy to the creation of the new horcrux and its placement inside of the very vault they just robbed and suddenly his victory in recovering the cup feels kind of fleeting. There's just no way they'll ever be able to break into Gringotts again and now the one weapon they had against the Horcruxes has become one. On top of that, the memory of Voldemort's recovery of Dumbledore's wand is fresh in his mind. What difference does a wand make? Have either of you ever heard of a more powerful wand? Harry asked Ron and Hermione. Of course not, Harry. Don't be silly. A wand is only as powerful as the wizard using it, Hermione responds. Except, of course, for the Elder Wand, Ron says, laughing at his own joke. This joke, however, is met with unusual stares from both Harry and Hermione. Harry looks like he doesn't understand the reference, and Hermione is kind of taken aback. How do you know about the Elder Wand? She asks. Asks. The Elder Wand, he repeats, you know, the tale of the three brothers, it's one of the objects death gives the three brothers, the wand, the resurrection stone, and the invisibility cloak, Hermione finishes. Right, so you've read it, and the Elder Wand is supposed to win you all duels and be the most powerful wand ever, worthy of the master of death or something. It's a kid's story. Why do you look so shook? I think we can all safely assume that this revision of the story is being written with like modern vernacular. No cap. I have literally no idea if I use that correctly. Anyway. It's just that I've only just read about it in that book Dumbledore left me. Why are you asking about a powerful wand, Harry? Dumbledore left you a book about a powerful wand? Because Voldemort's been looking for one and he just stole Dumbledore's. The three quickly exchange nervous glances as if checking if the others are thinking the same thing. Dumbledore had the Elder Wand. It's impossible, Harry. How could he have? Hermione asks. But Harry's mind is racing ahead, fitting the pieces together. Grigorovich, Grindelwald, they used to know each other. The legendary duel, Dumbledore won. And then Voldemort's potion, the curse in the ring, the duel at the ministry, and he killed Dumbledore. But there's more to it than that, he says, thinking out loud. If the wand is real, the other two items must be real too. The stone and the cloak. He stops mid-sentence. It's mine. My cloak, it's one of death's gifts or whatever. It's special, that's why I couldn't be found as a baby. Voldemort was in the house. Dumbledore knew, and the stone. Harry reaches into his bag for the snitch. Certain Dumbledores left it inside with the ring, but try as he might, he can't open it. We didn't really cover all of Harry's Quidditch stuff in year one, but rest assured it all went down as you'd expect with like the big mouth catch and such, and he's solved at the snitch to that point, but still can't solve the eye open at the close part. But it makes no difference, Harry. You still can't kill Voldemort if he has his Horcruxes. And even if you have these two gifts, he still has the wand. Hearing the word Horcrux seems to trigger something in Harry's mind, and he can suddenly see Voldemort checking the gaunt shack for the ring and head 
for the cave. We have to get to Hogwarts. There is something of Ravenclaw's there. Getting to Hogwarts is significantly easier since the entire ministry isn't after Harry this go round, and while Snape is still headmaster, Harry can at least fall back on the knowledge that he did give him the sword, even if it was just at Dumbledore's request. Even so, they decided it would be best if they don't alert Snape to their arrival just in case, so they apparate to Hogsmeade and decide to enter the school via the secret passage in Honeyduke, so yes, the twins still gave Harry the map. The issue is that once inside the castle, they don't know where to go. All Harry knows is that he saw in Voldemort's vision some kind of tiara thing with Ravenclaw's symbol. I know it's at Hogwarts, but I've never seen anything like that here. It was on a kind of bust of some kind. The three spend some time exchanging ideas, but the school is full of statues and they can't think of anything concrete. I just heard myself say it, the full of statues, can't think of anything concrete because statues are made, you get it. Well, then it must be somewhere in the castle we've never been. Is there anywhere? like that? Harry thinks again, but it's Ron who speaks up. The Chamber of Secrets, Harry. Seems like a great place to hide something, doesn't it? Only his heir could get in and nobody else knows where it is. Harry considers this, but decides against it. He wouldn't hide one that could be discovered with the other. It's just too risky. But you've given me an idea, Ron. You're brilliant. The Fangs, the Basilisk. They quickly realize there are at least three obvious rooms that they never would have visited inside of the castle. The other common room. They reason out pretty quickly that the Pufflepuff common room is the least likely as they already have the cup and Voldemort otherwise has the least connection to it, but that leaves either Slytherin or Ravenclaw that could make sense. So at once, Harry and Hermione set off to find McGonagall while Ron heads for the chamber, because don't forget, he's the one who actually opened it back in part one. He's not very great at parcel tongue, obviously, but he's confident enough that he can fake his way in. Meanwhile, Voldemort has successfully checked the gaunt shack and confirmed the loss of the ring and is on his way to the cave to check for the locket. Harry spots McGonagall in the corridor. Professor, we need to get into the Slytherin and Ravenclaw common rooms. Voldemort is coming and we need to find something we think it could be hidden in there. McGonagall is of course flustered by the surprise news and arrival of Harry and Hermione, but naturally accepts the severity of the situation with grace and pivots into general mode. Pierre Totem. Locomotor. She instructs Hermione as to how to access the Ravenclaw common room and with a nearly imperceptible smile says that she'll be confident that she'll be able to answer the door's question. As for Harry, she says she will escort him to Slytherin's common room and demand the students clear out as he's likely to have enemies down there. So Harry produces the invisibility cloak to hide beneath, which she is appropriately impressed by, like, whoa, totally didn't see that one coming. Get it? Because you're invisible. <laughs> McGonagall humor is the best. It's good to see you. Not. Once the common room is clear, Harry sets off to look and McGonagall goes to alert the rest of the staff about Voldemort's imminent arrival. The real question though is how will Snape react to this particular development? Because usually everyone believes he's killed Dumbledore at this point and pretty much hates him and they take this opportunity to expel him from the school. And while they're successful, it hurts their cause because Snape actually needs to talk to Harry. This time, however, his allegiance appears to still just be with the Order, which to be fair, it is, but Voldemort doesn't know that. So they trust him and he does at least help mobilize some defenses in the school. Harry finishes his search of the Slytherin common room and realizes that whatever it is he's looking for just isn't there. But by now, Voldemort has had another flash of rage in the cave and has realized the truth about the locket. He's on his way. Time is up. At this point, he remembers what Snape told him back in Grimmauld Place about coming to see him after he's completed his assignment. Clearly, it was instructions from Dumbledore about the Horcruxes, even if Snape didn't know what he was talking about. Obviously, the assignment isn't actually complete yet, but realizing time is up and out of leads, he decides it's his next best bet and heads for the headmaster's office. To his surprise, Snape is waiting for him at the bottom of the spiral staircase. With me, Potter, he turns to the gargoyle and states the password, Blood Pops. We totally loved the idea that Snape kept with the tradition of using candy as the password, and he's always described as being so bat-like, which made us think of vampires, but let's face it, Snape saying the word Pops is probably our biggest, like, reach in the whole what if. Snape eating a, a cake pop from Starbucks. Do they come in red? As Harry enters the familiar office, he notices one obvious change, the portrait of Albus Dumbledore hanging over Snape's desk. 
Have you completed your work, Potter? Snape drawls. No, sir. We've completed several parts, but not the whole thing, Harry says, hedging his information, unsure how much Snape is aware of. But it doesn't matter now. Voldemort is on his way here. Whatever you need to tell me, now is the time. Snape takes a deep breath considering the situation and turns his back to Harry. He stares up into the portrait of Dumbledore, which gives him a curt nod and Snape sighs. He looks more defeated than Harry would have thought possible. And so at long last, Snape reveals the truth about overhearing the prophecy, his role in Voldemort's attack on his parents, his undying and frankly inappropriate love for Lily, and his promise to always protect Harry. Always. Sorry for clarity, Snape doesn't include the inappropriate part, I just threw that in there so that you know that we know. Good? He tells him this so that Harry will trust him when he tells him that a part of Voldemort lives inside of him, and that for Voldemort to fall, so must Harry. You've been raising him like a pig for slaughter. Waves of emotion wash over Harry as he tries to take it all in, but in the time it's taken to learn all this, the attack on the castle has begun, and there is simply no time to dwell. Harry understands what must be done and stares up into the portrait of Dumbledore himself as if searching for answers, and suddenly, one hits him. The sight of Dumbledore reminds him of the last time they were together in the castle, training in the Room of Requirement, and it hits him. That's where the Horcrux is. He may have to die, but he can do everything he can to bring Voldemort closer to death as well. I know what I need to do, he says aloud to the portrait, which smiles down at him, and then ever so briefly it flashes its eyes towards the shelf in the corner. Harry looks and spies the old tattered hat and gasps. Professor Snape, can I... Take this. As Harry re-enters the corridors of the castle, the sounds of the ensuing battle can be heard everywhere, and to his absolute astonishment, he finds Hermione just outside the door and explains about the room and how Voldemort would have needed a place to hide the Horcrux. Hermione, who looks impressed, then pauses and whispers to herself, where do vanished objects go? Realizing Harry is looking at her, she confirms she didn't find it in the Ravenclaw common room, but she knows what it is. The lost diadem of Ravenclaw. There was a statue of her wearing it, and now Hermione at least knows what it looks like. Together, they race to the room of requirement and ask it to summon a room to hide things. The door appears, and they enter, astonished at the vast number of items. Harry immediately starts scanning for the bust he saw in Voldemort's vision when they see it. Hesitantly, Hermione reaches forward for the diadem. But how are we going to destroy it? She asks. Harry grins and holds up the sorting hat. It worked for me once before, back in the chamber. Stepping back, he reaches into the hat, waiting for the sword to materialize. Hermione holds her breath, but nothing. Defeated, Harry stares down at the very hat that placed him in Gryffindor all those years ago. I, I was so sure. Hermione also stares at the hat, then back at Harry. Where do vanished objects go? Uh, what? Responds Harry, confused. The riddle, when I went to Ravenclaw Tower, it asked me, where do vanished objects go? It's how Ravenclaws get into their dormitory. They have to answer a riddle. Except this time, I think maybe Ravenclaw was trying to tell me something. Vanished objects go into non-being, which is to say, everything. Hermione was talking so fast, Harry could barely take in everything she was saying. Harry, we can use fiend fire to destroy this. I read about it. It's powerfully destructive, but also completely uncontrollable. I would never use it otherwise, but this room, it's full of vanished objects. If we let it loose, the diadem will be destroyed and we can leave. It will be gone, contained. Hermione takes the diadem and places it on the floor. With their backs to the door, she raises her wand and casts the spell. Fire erupts in the form of a giant serpent, engulfing the space in flames. They watch as it tears through the room, and at the very last moment, step backwards into the castle corridor as the doors seal shut and morph back into castle wall. They exchange a look of triumph when they hear a blast from a staircase down below. The castle is fully under siege. They race through the chaos and find Ron, who is clutching Basilisk Fangs. The cup put up a fight, but it's gone. Brought these back for whatever you guys found. Did you find it? Well done, Ron, says Harry. It was the lost diadem of Ravenclaw. Hermione took it out with fiendfire. It was unbelievable. Harry steps back to take in his best friends who had followed him so far. We won't be needing the fangs though. With both Ron and Hermione present, he explains everything. How Snape overheard the prophecy, but changed sides in the end. How he tried to summon the sword with the sorting hat, but it didn't come. But most importantly, how he, Harry, was the other Horcrux. You'll have to finish what I couldn't, 
Harry says. Rowan and Hermione move to speak, but the castle wall behind them explodes and the battle is upon them. They turn just in time to catch sight of Harry throwing on the invisibility cloak and disappearing into the chaos. It doesn't take long. Voldemort is at the center of the action in the Great Hall. Harry rips off the cloak wordlessly to face him. Once again, he stands unarmed, save for the sorting hat, still gripped in his hand. Voldemort spots him immediately. All dueling stops at once. There is nothing but silence. Voldemort lifts the Elder Wand. Harry simply stares. And you know what happens next. Harry opens his eyes to the pure white of King's Cross Station. Dumbledore appears, explains his relationship with Grindelwald, how he came to win the unbeatable wand, whispering almost to himself, the wand chooses the wizard. Before Harry knows it, his whole body is in pain. He's lying on his face flat on the castle floor. There is silence still all around. Voldemort is telling his followers to step back for some reason. Murmurs fill the hall. Voldemort has fallen too, and they're helping him up. Snape is at his side. Check him! He demands. Harry can hear Snape's footsteps approach him, castle rubble crunching with each step. He can hear muffled crying all around him as the defenders of Hogwarts mourn his apparent death. Harry feels Snape by his side. His pulse will give him away. Harry had survived, but as soon as Snape reveals the truth, he has no protection left. Snape doesn't check his pulse though. Instead, as Snape leans over him, he feels something heavy appear on his chest. Harry can feel him sliding something from beneath him. The sorting hat? It couldn't be. Unable to resist, Harry opens his eyes a fraction to see what's happening and catches a glint of gold and green. Voldemort is watching in utter astonishment as Snape rises again and turns the golden sword of Gryffindor in his hands. Alive, he shouts. Rage explodes from Voldemort as Snape's true loyalties are finally revealed and green erupts from Voldemort's wand. But Snape lifts the sword in time. The spell collides with the golden blade. An explosion of light seems to erupt from the sword and Snape is flown backwards, but the sword clatters to the ground where he stood, black smoke billowing from it. The blade remains a vibrant gold, but the green fades back into red. The Horcrux is destroyed. Harry is back on his feet. He takes one glance at the invisibility cloak, but with Dumbledore's words ringing in his ears, he knows he doesn't need it because the wand chooses the wizard. It's over, Tom. All the Horcruxes have been destroyed. You've just destroyed the last two yourself. Surrender now before you make yet another mistake. Mistake? No, Potter, but it all makes sense now. When I fell at the Quidditch World Cup, a piece of myself found its way into you. You have used my own soul as a shield against me, but there is no one left to die for you this time. Not even me. Harriet raises Sirius's wand, ready for the attack. Ah, I see you don't even have your Phoenix wand. Then you are truly defenseless. You see, I have procured a wand of great power, the Death Stick, the Wand of Destiny, the Elder Wand and it will be the last thing you see. Harry's mind isn't in the Great Hall, it's in his final lesson with Dumbledore, in the Room of Requirement. After months of training, Harry had finally done it. He just hadn't known what at the time. Voldemort lets out one last massive, Avonacadabra! Harry thinks of Dumbledore holding Sirius's wand and returns, Expelliarmus! And it works, exactly like it had against Dumbledore the moment Harry had become the master of the Elder Wand without ever knowing it. Voldemort's spell backfires and it's over. And that is what would have happened if James hadn't let Dumbledore the invisibility cloak. Pretty basic stuff, really. <laughs> Guys, this has been so much fun, but my absolute favorite part had to be creating like this almost Sword of Slytherin concept. It feels like in a lot of ways, this represents the good aspects of Godric and Salazar's friendship. And in case you're wondering what happened there, basically Harry couldn't pull the sword in the room of requirement because it had become a Horcrux of the heir of Slytherin. But Snape could because he was a true Slytherin. And this is gonna be like in contrast to what Voldemort believes it means to be a Slytherin. And you know, 
screw that guy. We also really loved having Harry destroy the locket, Ron the cup, and Hermione the diadem, since in certain ways they all represent the other three houses, so it only felt fitting for them to destroy the adjoining Horcruxes. And in case you're wondering about the Resurrection Stone, obviously because they're in the castle, Harry just like dropping it on the floor seems like way too risky, so what we like to think happened is that Harry still goes out into the Forbidden Forest, has a moment with his parents, and lets them know that their deaths were not in vain, and then continues to hide it just in the pure nothingness that is the Void. As always, thank you guys so much for sticking with us for five whole parts of this series. We have had so much fun writing it and making it for you. We hope that you enjoyed it along the way. If you want some more Harry Potter action from us, you can check out our brand new podcast, Through the Gryffindor, right over here where we have the first few episodes available, and it's available wherever pods are cast. But otherwise, until next time, bye! <laughs>